Hello and welcome. I am Beth Mascheski, Assistant Research Scientist for Hazardous Waste and Pollutants at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Biancasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Adawa, Sauk, Muskaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these Native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community, inclusive of all our differences with Native peoples at the core of our efforts. This webinar and all of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars are certified great events through the University of Illinois Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment. To find out more about certified green events through U of I, please visit sustainability.illinois.edu. Find out more about the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars, or to sign up for our events email list, please visit isgc.illinois.edu slash events. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available for viewing online in about a week. I'll be sending an email out to everyone who registered for the webinar once those are available. Everyone will remain muted for the entire webinar. You can type in your questions through the Zoom Q&A feature at any time. You'll be able to upload questions you like within Zoom Q&A using the thumbs up button under the question. I'll be reading the questions to the speaker at the end of the webinar. At that time, the most popular question will be asked first, followed by the questions in the order that they were received. If you have technical difficulties, please send me a private chat message. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Vera, Nia, Vera Nianeshwar Gude. Nianeshwar is a professor of civil and environmental engineering and Nye Source Meyer Charitable Foundation Endowed Professor in the Department of Mechanical and Civil Engineering at Purdue University Northwest. He is also the director of Purdue University Northwest Water Institute, or PWI. Nianeshwar's research interests include energy, water, and environment nexus, resource recovery from wastewater, and sustainable energy systems development. He earned his bachelor's in chemical engineering technology from Ashmanya University, his master's in environmental engineering from the National University of Singapore, and a PhD in environmental engineering from New Mexico State University. Nina Schwarz's research efforts have, in, have received funding from federal agencies such as NSF, US EPA, USGS, and USDA, and other industry and international agencies. He has published over 150 scientific research articles and eight books on desalinization, wastewater treatment, and bioenergy research. So thank you, Nina Shwar, for joining us and the webinar is yours. Oh, you're muted. Thank you uh, everyone for this opportunity. I'm excited to be with you all. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound great, thanks. Thank you. I would like to start my presentation by acknowledging my research students, collaborators, and funding agencies. Thanks to all of you. And you have my contact information here in case you need to contact me. The outline of the presentation will include discussion on or introduction to infrastructure status, specifically wastewater infrastructure, wastewater industry thinking, and we'll look into energy aspects of wastewater treatment. Then we will look into resource efficient scenarios, followed by wastewater workforce scenario and requirements. Finally, we'll close the discussion with coming circling back to circular economy concept with concluding remarks. About 80% of the population in the United States are served by centralized wastewater treatment systems. 
and approximately 20% of Americans rely on septic tanks or on-site wastewater treatment. Also, we have over 1.3 million miles of public and private sewer lines. Most of the wastewater treatment plants are designed with a design capacity or lifetime of 40 to 50 years. And most of them have been built at the time of EPA uh, initiation in 1970s. There are over 16,000 wastewater treatment plants in the nation today. They're all, or on average, functioning at 81% of their design capacity. That means it correlates with what I've said just now. Most of the wastewater treatment plants were constructed in 1970s and 80s, where the environmental infrastructure received large funding, and they are now reaching their capacities for treatment. And 15% of, of them are, have already reached their design capacity or have exceeded it. That means they're ready for replacement or retrofitting to meet future demands. Also, if you see, every two minutes we have a water leak, water main break. And that means we have a lot of pipelines to be replaced. Our infrastructure is failing. There are about 15,000 to 2,000 miles of wastewater pipelines that need to be replaced every year. However, our current rate of replacement is only 5,000 miles per year. That is showing the increasing deficit in funding for the wastewater infrastructure. Overall, the wastewater infrastructure at the national level received a grade of D plus from American Society of Civil Engineers. This progress card or grade card considers, evaluation considers the performance, health and safety of the systems in meeting the, today's needs and future needs. Illinois is doing little better. It has a C minus grade. Our wastewater infrastructure uh, requires a lot of energy. Water and wastewater treatment together consume around 5% of the um, national electric load. About 25 mil billions are spent every year just for water and wastewater treatment operations and their maintenance. And we will need over $2 trillion over the next 20 years to build, maintain, and replace older systems and to stay up to date. This is a large, large demand. And if we are going to invest this huge amount of funding over the next 20 years, and we should be thinking about what kind of systems, what kind of innovative features we want to include in the system that are so that they are resilient and productive. Oftentimes wastewater or water infrastructure is looked into as a burden, but however, if we invest in wastewater infrastructure, it actually releases many benefits. For example, this is an older scenario for year 2020 I still chose to use this scenario. If only we spend $84 billion, invest $84 billion in current wastewater infrastructure, that could save 700,000 jobs or create 700,000 jobs and 541 billion in personal income and 416 billion in gross damaged product. And also it will save the household costs for receiving these services. So we know that conventional wastewater treatment system, especially those who are in environmental engineering field, they know it's the activated switch process, the robust and most dominant process in the field today. It is highly reliable. 
and mature technology with over 120 years of history in performance and, and productivity. However, it also has its own limitations. It can only strengthen low strength, it can only treat low strength waste wastewaters. It has high capital expenditures. The energy consumption is very high for accurate research process. Also, it produces 40% of the sludge in the carbon that is removed by the activated sludge process results in 40% of excess sludge generation, which needs to be disposed or managed effectively. In the past, wastewater is considered as nuisance, as a burden, just simply put as waste. And our thinking was to just remove and get rid of it, discharge it. We also know that it's an energy sink even today. And also wastewater treatment requires investment. Some view wastewater as nutrient drain, as cause of all environmental pollution. Now the industry is changing. Our thinking is changing, thankfully. We appreciate it and we view it as a resource. Instead of removing pollutants, we would like to recover resources from wastewater. That is the forward thinking that we are instilling in the field and as educationalists today. We would like to reuse resources and recover as much water as possible. The wastewater is now viewed as an energy source. It's also viewed as it's potentially, uh, it can be a revenue generator more interestingly, some of the applications include environmental flow, where there is lack of flow in surface water bodies and even groundwater reserves. Wastewater is now being treated to the quality suitable for these applications. Overall, wastewater is now viewed as a resource. Interesting enough, it has 10 times the energy needed to treat it. It also has substrates that are required for energy generation. In some places, water that is recovered from wastewater treatment is considered as new water and used in almost near non-portable uses. Some places even go beyond and use it for drinking pot water augmentation. Nutrients can be effectively removed from wastewater in the form of struvite, which is known as foot fertilizer. As a result, we would like to view as wastewater treatment plants as water resource recovery facilities rather than treatment plants or waste dealing plants. This view of wastewater treatment plants or this thinking of water resource recovery facilities is now emerging and is growing in, in the field. So what do we have in the wastewater? We have carbon, organic carbon, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus. Of course, there are pathogens in it. But if you look at wastewater as an energy source, we know that carbon that's present in the form of waste is an energy source. Nutrients can contribute in this process or if they can be recovered, they would also help, help save energy. There is also, an, we do not talk much about thermal energy in wastewater because wastewater temperatures vary um, by season and the temperature gradient that's available is, is not enough or it's not adequate for appropriate systems to be uh, implemented. And so a large amount of wastewater is, um, energy is not recovered. However, 
the energy that we can extract is already three times, three to four times more than what is needed for its treatment, as you'll see here in this chart. From now on, we'll be focusing on the energy performance wastewater, of wastewater treatment systems. Although there are other aspects of nutrient recovery and water recovery, because the topic is so broad, we will limit our conversation to just energy performance of wastewater treatment plants. Wastewater treatment plants can be categorized into three types based on how they're doing in, in terms of energy. Energy negative, energy self-sufficient, or energy positive. So which is determined by the equation as I displayed here, net energy ratio, energy generated over energy consumed. If it is a greater than one, we know that it is energy positive. If it is less than one, it is energy negative. Equal to one, it's energy self-sufficient. If you look at the wastewater energy demands requirements, the specific energy consumption, which is the amount of energy or elect in terms of electricity, kilowatt hours required for treating one cubic meter of wastewater, which varies between 0.25 kilowatt hours to 1.1 kilowatt hours, depending on the type of wastewater and the treatment scheme. And you see here on the same chart, aeration accounts for up to on average, 53% of the overall energy consumption in the process. It can go up to 75 to 80% as well. Sludge treatment is the next major energy consumer, pumping, moving water from one unit to the other, and others. This represents the facilities as a whole where they have lighting fixtures and other uh, heating and cooling requirements for facilities. Now you will note that these fractions do not add to one or 100%. It's not intended to be that way, but rather they show the kind of more common value or percentage of their contribution in energy consumption. What do we know about wastewater treatment today? Many of us know that treatment capacity matters. Capacity determines the cost effectiveness of the process and energy recovery potential. We also know that treatment configuration is very critical to, to determining the performance of the system or the performance depends on the process configuration. And also many utilities place energy efficiency as a priority because it includes lots of costs. You'll see that in these two charts, there are different processes, activated sludge, trickling filters, advanced wastewater treatment without nitrogen, and aerobic wastewater treatment and with nitrogen. So when we include nitrogen removal, biological removal, we see that there's higher demand for electricity. And of course the costs will be higher as well. But now we wanna ask questions. We said that there are 80% of the systems that are served by centralized wastewater treatment infrastructure and the 20% of the Americans are served by on-site wastewater treatment systems. Now, the question is, how can we achieve energy self-sufficiency or energy positive performance for all, all these plants, regardless of their scale? I think more importantly, we'd like to ask now, what can the existing wastewater treatment plants do right now to become energy positive. 
what kind of technologies that we need to invest in so that this goal can be achieved? And what should we consider moving forward when we have to invest in new design and implementation of new wastewater treatment plants? We can certainly start with energy conservation efforts and put efforts to increase energy. So increase energy generation potential. So by just conserving energy or taking steps to conserve energy across the plant, we can see there's lots of opportunities. We see that just replacing aeration diffusers with higher performance diffuser systems can save 45% of energy demand in that area alone. Changing the pumps the variable frequency drives so that you can control the speed and pumping that could save up to 74% in that area. As we look at the wastewater treatment plant facilities, utilities itself, looking at the lighting, heating and cooling appliances applications, there's also a good chance of reducing energy consumption. Further, what we would like to consider is, can we increase carbon capture? We said carbon is equal to energy. So if we enhance carbon capture and also receive additional waste that is rich in carbon, with, along with equipment upgrades, we can definitely move the wastewater treatment systems to be energy positive. However, we want to look beyond that, right? Energy efficiency alone is not our concern, but we should be looking beyond. So we need to be thinking about developing resource efficient wastewater treatment systems. What do we mean by resource efficiency here? Those systems that consume less energy, less chemical consumption, and that release less greenhouse gas emissions and that result in less waste generation. Those are called resource efficient systems. And of course, if it is more profitable and environmentally friendly, they are more sustainable. So what are these? And how do we achieve these? First key to this is to enhance carbon capture within the system. We will discuss how we do that. If possible or where possible, we should include co-digestion by receiving co-digestion schemes with the existing anaerobic digesters. If they're not already operating at their design capacity, this can be a revenue generating process because for, for accepting the waste from other industries, we could charge them to pay a tipping fee that could be a revenue for the wastewater treatment plant. And of course, we would like to continue to innovate and integrate energy and resource efficient treatment processes. Here, I'm gonna highlight about anaerobic treatment processes. Anaerobic treatment was, was actually one of the first treatment technologies that we had in the past continue to use for high strength applications. However, it needs to be revived and implemented more, considered more in new designs because they have their own merits that they offer. We will look into, among those based on anaerobic wastewater treatment, we would like to consider Anamox partial nitrotation process for nitrogen removal bioelectrical electrochemical treatment process for both carbon and nitrogen removal, 
and finally microalgae based treatment processes. So we will discuss about these processes. As we know, bacteria and microalgae have a very interesting and synergistic relationship. You can consider this as a partnership. See the bacterium release carbon dioxide, which is required by microalgae for their synthesis. And oxygen produced by microalgae can be used by bacteria. So it is a win and win situation in those systems that integrate bacteria and microalgae. More work has to be done in this area so that we take advantage of this synergistic relationship. The other example of resource efficient wastewater treatment, the biological treatment that includes carbon and nitrogen removal would be Anamox process, especially for nitrogen removal. This is also called shortcut nitrogen removal process where you know that ammonium ion, ammonium is converted to nitrogen or partially converted to nitride. And in return, ammonium and nitride are combined or used by the Anamox bacterium through a process called, to the bacteria known for what they do, they anaerobically oxidize ammonium. Therefore, they're called Anamox bacteria to directly convert ammonium into nitrogen gas. If you're not here, this nitrogen cycle, the red arrow shows the shortcut process where Ammonium is partially oxidized to nitrite. As a result, ammonium and nitrite are available for, the, for utilization by Anamox bacteria to result in nitrogen removal. So as you see here in this cycle, you'll note that at least half of the energy demand for aeration is reduced by considering Anamox bacteria. So 58% of oxygen requirement is eliminated through this process. Carbon is requirement is also eliminated. 83% of biosolids production and their management issues are also avoided through this process. Moreover, this process does not include or release any green ga gas emissions. Anamox bacteria can also be conveniently used in bioelectrochemical systems where they can serve in the cathode chamber. For brevity, I'm not going into a lot of details here because there's more to discuss. In a microbial fuel cell concept, anode and cathode, two electrodes, both can be housing microorganisms. One anode will, re will remove organic carbon while cathode can be used to remove nitrogen where Anamox can be employed. So in this innovative process, it's possible that we generate electricity for what we do at a large energy expense in activated storage process. So I would like to share some examples here of how these different schemes we talked about, carbon capture, co-digestion schemes, and bioelectrochemical systems, how they can contribute to energy efficiency uh, in wastewater treatment systems. So for the first example, we can consider a wastewater treatment plant that has a primary treatment system, an activated sludge tank and secondary settler, which is treating 10 million gallons per day of water with a COD of 500 milligrams per liter. And you will note that this process is integrated with co-digestion scheme, anaerobic digester, and energy recovery process, which is a combined heat and power system here. The energy balance of this system shows that there are various elements where we use, we have energy losses, but there's an energy production here. So, 
the overall energy consumption for this process is 0.378 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. If we do not consider co-digestion, then the energy gain would be only 0.21 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And, but with co-digestion, it is turning out to be energy positive. Another example where we can think about including innovative features such as micro sieving filtration. As you will see here in the previous example, the primary settling process is only removing about 30 to 40% of carbon that's entering the process. Whereas we can increase the carbon removal. This is an example of enhanced carbon capture where we are able to remove 60% of COD through micro saving filtration or micro saving, which then the effluent from this will be subjected to treatment in high rate auger ponds. This scheme also involves co-digestion and anaerobic digestion system. Here we call it anaerobic co-digester. It's because it's taking, it's a co-digestion system basically. And further treatment of biogas can release carbon dioxide back into um, HRAP so that um, carbon dioxide can be utilized by microorganisms or microalgae. So the energy balance of this system shows that there is energy produced through the co-digestion of sewage and algae, sludge, and there is energy produced from fog and sewage algae. So together, and when we subtract the energy expenses for different processes, we see that the total net energy balance is 1.682, the ratio, that means it is 68% energy positive. Let's look at more examples here those systems that become, um, that have achieved energy self-sufficiency or energy positive status. In this chart, we see that um, there are many wastewater treatment plants that are mostly implementing co-digestion schemes and both in US and abroad. That's Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and, and the other plants are from USA. The blue text represents those systems that have achieved energy self-sufficiency status. That means they have reached 100% self-sufficiency. Whereas the green systems have achieved energy positive status, that means they are feeding back to the grid by 20 to 40% or they're selling their energy um, by, to, their, to the customers, they're about 20 to 40% of excess energy that's being generated. So what we need to note here is the plant capacity and the, the energy efficiency status. You will note that many plants here are less than 10 million gallons per day. We know that, or it's been very commonly heard in the field that small wastewater treatment plants cannot be energy positive. For that reason, we do not usually design anaerobic digesters for wastewater treatment systems under 5 million, with capacity under 5 million gallons per day. Whereas we see that in this table, there are wastewater treatment systems that are able to achieve energy positive status when they consider co-digestion schemes. And of course, other, other process innovations are necessary to conserve energy so that there would be more energy benefits out of the process. This graph also shows that, shows actually different con combinations of 
combined heat and power systems and the plant capacity and the type of waste that has been used in the co-digestion scheme. Let's say that fat, oil, grease, sludge, and high strength waste coming from industries or agriculture, food industry. Um, at small scale, less than 20 million gallons per day, these plants are able to achieve energy positive status. The purpose of this graph is to show that there is a certain combination of the waste and process scheme and co-digestion and the energy recovery scheme, which is combined heat and power systems, they come in different forms and they, their selection is very important for, this, for the maximization of energy benefits. Now we will go into go further into different scenarios and try to understand how anaerobic treatment processes can um, can help us achieve these this energy positive status. Here I'm showing an example where we take the basis is per capita the amount of COD generator per day per capita per person, right? 110 grams of COD and 10 grams of nitrogen is being generated on a daily basis. And if you consider in this process, there is um, a bioelectrochemical system that is replacing the activated sludge tank. And we also note that there's a red uh, cathode to show that Anamox biocathode, which is removing nitrogen in the cathode chamber. So this process has a, it's very similar to the conventional activated sludge process, except that it has, the biological treatment scheme is different in which we have a bioelectrochemical system. You will note that this process is not consuming energy for its biological removal of organic carbon and nitrogen. Rather, it is showing an energy recovery potential of 23 grams of COD, equivalent to 23 grams of COD. Due to time constraints, I'm not able to share all details of the process here, but there is link and I have also included um, a number of references for further reading. This, there's a lot of work that we have done in the past year uh, and, so, um, and there are publications on this work. So you, you are encouraged to read or to know more about these um, configurations that we have studied here. Well, anaerobic digestion becomes the integral part and an important component of this entire process. Now, now that we have introduced bioelectrochemical systems, as replacing the main body of the biological treatment process. Now we can imagine different scenarios to be considered that, sh that show potential for energy positive or energy self-sufficiency status. So we have six scenarios here. Note that all of these configurations are considering biological uh, nitrogen removal as well, although we don't show it here. S1 and S2, S3, S4, S5, and S6. And you note that there is small carbon here and there is large carbon here. This is the size is to represent the enhanced carbon capture occurring in this configuration compared to scenario one. Scenario two considers enhanced carbon capture. Um, so S1, and here you'll see that the different notations here, OCR represents organic carbon removal, AN represents aeration for nitrogen removal. So these are energy expenses and pumping and mixing. And these are all expressed in watt per hour, watt hours per person per day. The units are given there. Scenarios one and two are similar, whereas three and four are different. 
three and four and, and one, three, one, two, and five are also similar because except that five is accepting external carbon source, which is co-digestion scheme here. Um, it's receiving high strength waste from other sources. Now S3 is considering Anamox treatment system and AN stands for anaerobic treatment. So not the aeration unit, but anaerobic treatment followed by Anamox nitrogen removal process and, and the rest of the process is same. And we see here there's a microbial uh, bioelectrochemical system in place which is supported by uh, an external simultaneous nitrogen and denitrification, nitrification and nitrification and denitrification process that SNAD included in scenario four. And then last scenario where we just replace everything. In other words, we combine MFC microbial fuel cell with SNAD, right, process together in a, in a single process. In this case, we're showing three different chambers, but it can, does not have to be three different chambers. It can be just two chambers. Out of all these configurations, you will see that organic carbon removal in four of these configurations is showing a negative value. That means we are using energy to remove carbon in these configurations. However, we are making energy in scenarios four and six because we have implemented bioelectrochemical systems. So if we look at the energy performance of these systems, you will note that this is our reference line here, green dotted line. S1 is still below because it does not, it has an anaerobic digester in place, but it doesn't, process enough solids to be able to energy be positive. So while in S2, you note that we have considered enhanced carbon capture. So this is referring to the green shade is referring to an net energy ratio. That is what we're interested in. So what we're trying to do here is we are reducing energy consumption across scenarios, S1, S2, S3, S4, and six, you see that all of the cases, energy consumption is being reduced. And as a result, energy recovery is maximized. And, net, and finally, net energy ratio is increasing. You'll see that when we integrate bioelectrochemical systems, there is possibility for increasing the net energy benefit significantly. So switching to another topic here that is of more concern for us today, I wanted to just briefly talk about the workforce. This, this study uh, conducted by Brookings um, a, a firm here, they report that water workers fill a variety of jobs and are present in every region. So as you see here, the presenter five, four characteristics of the wastewater industry or in general water workforce. They said the, the water workers earn more competitive and equitable wages and water workers often have less formal education and boast many transferable skills, which is good. That means it can attract more uh, workforce into this field. But what is alarming and concerning here is the one of the statements said, water workers tend to be older and lack gender and racial diversity in certain occupations pointing to the need of younger, more diverse talent. So this is the message for today in terms of water workforce. We need to be engaging young minds in our water infrastructure development, education. They need to be taught all the way through their education levels, K through 12 or through university. It is important that we include the, the new generations in this process of educating them and making them aware of environmental 
management and how important it is to take care of these systems. Unfortunately, water or wastewater treatment um, field, it, engineering field does not sound as fancy as artificial intelligence or space science or machine learning, but we can make it interesting for our, we, it is our responsibility to encourage future generations to look further into and, and, and to help them understand it's the importance of this critical infrastructure. Finally, I would like to give a few thoughts about why we want to develop resource efficient systems, wastewater treatment systems, and how they can play a part in circular economy. We can now realize that based on just the energy conversation alone that we had so far in, in the previous 30 minutes, we can see that wastewater in front, wastewater has a lot to offer. If only we implement sustainable wastewater treatment technologies through circular economy approaches, we can recover water, energy, nutrients, and other valuable byproducts. And that can be fed back into industry and other relevant fields. As an example, how do we, how do the constituents of wastewater contribute to circular economy? You'll see that we know that there's carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and wastewater. This chart shows that if you have to remove, that's our current thinking, we have to remove carbon, remove carbon, but we are spending energy to remove carbon. Whereas if we you make use of carbon to produce energy, there is an energy recovery potential of 3.86 kilowatt hours per kilogram of carbon. Same thing here, nitrogen. We, to remove one kilogram of nitrogen, it requires 13.44 kilowatt hours of energy. Whereas if we can recover this nitrogen somehow through various processes, we can save as much as 19.3 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So where do you think this number came from? Because to produce the same amount of nitrogen through well-known processes, processes we have in industry today, they consume this much of, much of energy. That means they have potential to contribute to circular economy. Then you see the same case for phosphorus. We're able to produce, if we are able to recover, we are actually saving so much of energy that would go, otherwise go into their production. Always we look into costs, right? Money, what can we get out of it? So as a result, if you see here, wastewater can generate all of these valuable products such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and water, and solids, biosolids that could be used as soil conditioner. And of course, we talked a lot about biogas production through anaerobic digesters and co-digestion. As we see these values here, the cost, water itself is showing, is, that's why I consider water to be a major resource that should be recovered and which has the greatest value. Of course, methane only shows seven cents per cubic meter. However, if we recover this methane and use it as an ingredient in other processes that produce other value, high value products such as bioplastics, methanol, or simply convert into energy that will produce more um, revenue. So we see that there is a large potential for wastewater to be contributing towards the circular economy here. So my concluding remarks would be, small wastewater treatment plants can achieve energy positive status with the right configuration and co-digestion schemes. In fact, all processes, all wastewater treatment processes can achieve this status if they implement innovative treatment process, process schemes, and enhance carbon capture and increase energy generation potential. Also, we note that um, energy uh, wastewater treatment systems and their endeavors should look beyond just treatment. 
just removing waste to re recovering uh, wa valuable products. Also, wastewater treatment systems should be considered as an integral part of overall water and industry portfolio, especially considering agriculture and food sectors. This is a major drawback today. Our the funding situation is so bad for water and wastewater infrastructures because they're viewed separately. They're not viewed as a, a critical element of the overall society of sustainable development. We should continue to explore innovative wastewater treatment technologies so that for both small and large scale, scale applications. Of course, and finally, as we looked into the resource efficient technologies that we discussed, they can contribute to our circular economy. And if we would like to generate further high value products that incurs additional resources and investments, but they can be justified from sustainability point of view. But however, thorough evaluation of those scenarios should be uh, conducted. And these are my uh, concluding thoughts. If you would like to learn more about what we discussed today, please uh, refer to these publications from our research group. Thanks, Tina, for, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, before we get to Q&A, I will remind everyone that you can type in your questions through the Zoom Q&A. And then if I can, I would also like to give a plug for my colleague, uh, my colleagues at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. They uh, work in the technical assistance group um, here at ISTC. And they currently have a grant that helps assist um, publicly owned wastewater treatment plants reduce their energy, like these principles that Neo Ashwar has uh, presented today. Uh, you can find some links in the Q and A. Uh, Bill has posted those. And okay, our first question is. Uh, the type of wastewater treatment plant systems depend, um, I'm sorry, let me start over. The type of wastewater treatment plant systems used depends in part on how distributed the populations are across the landscape. For example, farmers and those located near farmlands necessarily have different systems than those systems that service cities. And as city size increases, systems used also change. How size sensitive are energy efficiencies estimated for different systems and are size, size considerations taken into account? Um, thank you for this interesting question. And it is very important. It's because it's many of these on-site and remote um, wastewater treatment systems suffer from this kind of drawback because they're small in size. But however, my argument here is that if we consider co-digestion or even innovative wastewater treatment technologies, such as the, one of the cases that we looked in today um, as uh, uh, the micro sieving process and um, also using trickling filters or high rate algal points, these systems can become energy positive or energy efficient. Simply we're interested in energy, improving energy efficiency. So there is a study, there, there are technologies on the table that we seem to forget sometimes. There are technologies for every scale. It's, that is my argument today is size doesn't matter. Capacity doesn't matter. So I started with, we know wastewater capacity is important because it determines that. That is what we know, that is our conventional wisdom but it's not, that it's not entirely true if we are willing to consider other options, right? Other alternatives, other treatment configurations and, and possibilities. In, uh, so as uh, a study conductor, not in the United States has, has already shown at such a small scale, it's about 380 cubic meters per day, which is like, um, uh, which is like thousand gallons, thousand, 380, maybe 10,000 gallons uh, per day. 
of wastewater treatment system is able to achieve energy positive nature when they status when they are able to when they consider um, enhanced carbon capture and trickling filter and microalgae uh, polishing system. So size does not matter. Uh, we have all, to answer your question. Well, we have studied. We have. Um, studied across a large range of capacities. So we are able to, and looking at uh, what has been done in the field, these are not just simulative work, but it's not through a program, uh, you know, or simulation or mathematical calculations, but we also have uh, sought information from actual wastewater treatment systems that are in practice today. And we are able to um, say that we are confident that, you know, if, uh, if proper measures taken, size doesn't matter to achieve energy efficiency in wastewater treatment. Our next question is, uh, in regard to the circular economy with wastewater treatment plants, historically spreading waste sludge on farm fields ha um, as fertilizer has been viewed as sustainable practice. Recently, we've seen more articles concerning high perfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS concentrations in waste sludge, which, um, has in turn been spread on farm fields. So what are your thoughts on how to deal with emerging PFAS issues? And if I can also add other um, emerging contaminants. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, what is in biosolids or the whatever we use, um, apply on land becomes an issue, right, in biosolids. So PFAS have emerged as as a critical pollutants uh, recently, and they they are everywhere, and they continue to pose challenges for almost all environmental professionals in the field today. Um, currently, as far as I know, uh, there is a lot of work going on on how to deal with the PFAS PFAS present in solids. Um, unfortunately, that is is a current challenge um, in the field today. Um, um, to my knowledge, there are no cost-effective solutions yet. There's a lot of work to be done in that area. Reminder, if you haven't already done so, to please post your questions in the Q&A. The chat is only for technical issues. So our next question is, can you recommend a good resource to learn more about uh, Ammonox bioelectrical chemical systems? Yes, I would say, I would probably say, just go ahead and read our own publications. So look for my search for my name in Google Scholar or online. You'll definitely find some of the work that we did. Um, in this area. And there are also certain other groups around the world are pursuing this activity. Uh, we've been working on it for a while now. Uh, it is a very promising process. So please look up online. Actually, I have included, um, let me check here. I think the, one of the references that I have included in further reading um, is about uh, the process. So you can read through and Please get in touch with me if you have any questions on that. Uh, we are getting close to the hour. Um, do you have five or 10 more minutes for a couple more questions? Yes, okay. I see here a question, an interesting question about um, thermal energy in the wastewater. There are plants, uh, Rick Manor, so to answer your question, there are plants in Canada. There are one or two plants you will see that our examples actually as a whole in the whole United States and uh, across the world, you'll see that there are very few plants that are actually doing co-digestion 
or even being energy positive. So that's one story. But when it comes to thermal energy, it's, it's really not so common in the wastewater industry because it's not so much appreciated because of its low temperature gradient. But Canada and some of maybe one or two examples I can find in uh, in the uh, European countries, but there are a few that are um, harvesting uh, energy, that, uh, thermal energy from wastewater. How much is the potential of carbon capture in small scale wastewater treatment plants? Yes, it depends on how much we have, right? We cannot get more than what's in there. So it depends on how much we have. It doesn't, again, it doesn't matter if small or big. Um, if we consider sieving rather than just primary sedimentation unit, which if we replace primary clarifier with micro sieving filtration process, is almost 70% of removal of carbon capture can be expected. Are these processes primarily lab scale, pi lab scale or pilots, or are there any full scale studies? Okay, so for uh, the co-digestion schemes that I have discussed, they're widely applied in the field, okay? They are, um, in the, they are at the field level or the industry scale. Um, and uh, the, some of the system that I discussed with, um, especially that are uh, implementing Animax process, they are not so common or so commonly um, practiced in industry, but there are, a good number of plants that are implementing the process in the Europe and United States is actually marching towards enhancing uh, implementation of NMOX based processes because we also start to realize that coming to bioelectrochemical systems, they are actually transitioning or you know, advancing from a laboratory scale to a pilot scale studies to commercialization. So they're getting there. They're not there yet in the field yet. Do you have any information on the cost comparison of the S1 through S6 alternative wastewater treatment schemes? Um, I do not have. That is something we would like to look into further. That's a great question. Thank you. Are you seeing much or increased use of, of water source heat pumps at wastewater treatment plants? Yes, there is consideration because energy is becoming very important recently. So it doesn't matter where the energy is coming from, but there is great interest in recovering this. So they, there is interest. However, it's not as high as you would see in other fields or from or other industries where they, they have much high value waste sources, waste energy sources. I'll take these last two questions and then we'll end. Um, so what are the biggest hurdles in making wastewater treatment plants energy sustainable? In, um, is it the scale of economics, et cetera? Yes, you know, the scale of economics is, is a conventional wisdom. We all know that. So that's that we cannot overturn that, but that is in place. However, that, so that is my, my addition to that is that, how can we overcome that and make things work for us? So scale of economies is always there, but at the same time, if we come up with innovative processes, we can definitely um, turn down the scenario, yes. And our last question, uh, what is the form of energy resulting from the bioelectrochemical uh, process, um, so methane, hydrogen, et cetera? The beauty of uh, uh, the wastewater uh, treatment in bioelectrochemical systems is that it directly produces electricity, directly. Clean electricity, we call it clean electricity. So we do not, this, of course, there are other types of bioelectrochemical systems that produce either methane, or hydrogen and both, that's possible. But uh, if you are using a configuration where you are targeting towards electricity generation, so that's a clean form of energy in the highest grade you can get without the need for purification or refining or anything. Well, thank you for a lively discussion um, and thank you for presenting today. Um, are there any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Oh, I see a comment here. I agree that um, 
if someone has expected to see a lot of algae examples, but uh, definitely algae shows great potential to be uh, to contribute towards circular economy. And I've been I'm I'm a big fan of algae. I worked um, for a while with algae. So uh, this you know the purpose of this talk is to discuss what's on, what's out there, you know, in different. Um, uh, or different alternatives we have. So I only used algae in one example, but one of my examples is considering algae, but I agree. Um, or definitely I would be happy to get in touch with you um, about the algal processes. Yes. Great, thank you. And we'll go ahead and end the webinar.